Okay, so my next installment here is something called Age of Gods. Um, topic and presentation makes it appear to be uh, in the Ameritrash category. I bought this used and I seem to have a lot of extra things in it. A bunch of these little blue chits and some little fishbowl stuff. I've got them sorted out there, but I don't think they have anything to do with the game. Uh, my first thought when buying the game, as always, I have these hopes for something more than what most games that aren't put out as detailed war games, uh, and I mean the heavy end of the war gaming spectrum as known now, uh, you know, the stuff that used to be called war games. Anything that's not put out by them tends to disappoint me. It's not a, an absolute rule. Uh, there are certainly some games that, uh, in, in the Euros recently, I've run across a couple that have pleased me. And I've run across a couple of uh, <coughs> yeah, I can't, I can't say I've been buying kind of the low end on the, the Ameritrash stuff so I can't say that I, I've hit anything that's really absolutely you know made me happy but this was one for Topic that I said ah, you know, I want a game where I'm, I'm playing a god and I'm directing races and this that, and the other well ends up feeling a little bit like History of the World or uh, maybe I'm trying to think I had another one in mind Any, uh, anyway fa fairly simple oh Vinci and probably Small World as well uh, fairly small uh, rule set not a lot going on uh, going on in it. Not the kind of agonizing decisions that I wanted a god to have to make in order to, you know, make themselves the dominant god on a on a continent or whatever. But maybe an interesting game. I wanna certainly play it and uh be able to give a reasonable review on that. So let me go over a little bit of the rules are not tough. Uh, but I might as well go over them because they'll give you a better idea of the game than anything else. First of all, you set up, and these counters are double-sided depending on how you like things. They get the word for the race on one side, but a more distinctive picture that I find easier to identify on the other. Uh, you set up the races. That's a preordained pattern. Uh, I guess it's possible that one could make some sort of some sort of uh, variance to this that would have that, but you use this setup on the base uh, on the rule book, and there does and nothing else is included. You also set up additional counters for each of these races, which is sort of their growth potential. The one exception to that is the goblins have an additional growth potential, which can be gained by card play. Races are either size one, in which case they have a total of two counters, one on the board, one here. Size two, total of four counters, two on the board, two here, et cetera, up to size four, which is four on the board, eight, no, eight total. Okay. Now, the goal of the game is to get points for races that you are responsible for. And each player is going to be dealt one of these cards at different periods in the game. Different game turns have special different effects on them. So every odd number turn, one through seven, gives you a new race and information on whom you have to protect. Okay. And if that race does well, you get points based on how well it does. Uh, those points, I don't know, uh, let's see what it is. One point for each territory controlled by a race you represent, 
and an extra point for each city, which is these red bordered areas, and the map is so colorful that it's actually difficult to discern the information on it, which largely is the, uh, the red things for play. The color patterns are important to telling you what the setup is, although they aren't necessarily trivial to see at a glance. For example, the hobbits are here, and let's turn them up to their chef side. And the humans have a similar color, but it is possible to, to recognize those patterns. It's just, it's just sometimes you might get a little confused on it. Those don't serve any other purpose that I see except setup, though. Okay. So, that's, uh, that's the main flow of the victory points, what you're trying to do. You get points for races that you're responsible for doing well. There's an additional set of points which can be gotten by betting on races you don't control. And if those races... Uh, are full in territories, if they have their max size, um, you get three points. So you can bet on a race doing as well as possible at the end of the game. Interesting idea. All right. Special turns? Well, uh, I think I ought to hold on those because other than the races distributing, most of them are pretty, you probably should understand the base flow of the game. So what happens in the base flow of the game? Well, we have a nice set of rounds here. First, the destiny phase. And we'll look at the rules and see what that does. Um, that's when this special effect takes place. We'll skip that for a moment because, well, why not? All right. So on one, three, five, and 7, each player gets a race. And they start with the biggest races, and they work their way down. Uh, to these tiny ones, who probably have a good chance of being wiped out, I think, by the time that you get the responsibility for them. The next, uh, the next one of these that's possible is these revolts of minor races, and they happen on turns one, a two, four, and six. Uh, each player in turn and there's this little turn order marker. And you'll notice I haven't clipped the counters on these. I did one and then kind of mutilated the counter because circles that are thick counters are particularly hard to do. So I said, you know, I'm just as happy with little tabs as mutilated counters when it comes down to it. <laughs> okay. So each turn, the turn order path marker will pass. And I, of course, will be going counterclockwise as always just to show that do things differently. Um, okay. So on the revolt of the minor races, depending on the turn, different each player in turn gets to activate different sized races that haven't yet been assigned to do things. So they have a chance to grow before somebody is really paying much attention to them. Uh, and they're allowed to do an attack. And like History of the World, uh, that's like an expansion phase in that game. It's your only way to really do anything successful with, 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 uh, with your races. Otherwise, they largely just sit there unless you play cards on them. And like History of the World, you have a set of cards. Of course, you only have, well, you have eight cards, and there's only two stacks that they come from. And those stacks are directly related to one of the races in the game in terms of what the power does and how it relates to that. And then there's an effect because of, there, there's a reason why that's, why they actually have to be linked to the uh, races. On turn seven, uh, oh, no. Yeah, at the beginning of turn seven, after the races are distributed, each player gets to lay his bets down. And he's allowed to lay one yellow card bet and one red card bet. And this is where the names come in. So, for example, if I played a yellow card, I would be saying, I am betting that the Dark Elves will use all their pieces. And if they do, at the end of the game, I get three victory points. So now, as part of setup, so far the players have had no choices. 
They've got a pile of these. These are fortifications they can play during the course of the game. They also each got two Age of God cards, uh, or two God cards. And each one picked one of them, and they'll each have some special abilities based on that. I don't know how balanced these are, but I tried to make judgment which one sounded most interesting to the players involved. We'll go over those special powers after we know the rules, I guess. And remember, that's only half the deck of those. All of the yellow and red cards have been dealt out. Uh, in a small, less than six players, less cards get dealt out. The others are just discarded into the box. Nobody knows what's not in the game. Okay. So... The next thing we hit is the fortification phase, and each player in turn is allowed to play one of these little wooden discs that they get at the beginning of the game on a territory. Doesn't have to be any ownership of them or of theirs or anything, but there does have to be a race in it, and there cannot already be a fortification. Okay. Then we go to the combat phase, and each player in turn gets to do this, and they choose an attacking territory anywhere on the board that has a person, and they must do this. There's no option. They must pick someone to attack. Uh, and you are not allowed to choose to attack with someone whose destiny card, these numbered cards that indicate that you control the race, has been revealed by you. When you draw those, they're face down. You have the option to reveal them at times. So if you've revealed it, you're not allowed to attack with that race, but you can attack if you know about it, if you have the card in your hand. In order to do the attack, you roll a die and you want a three or higher. And there's some modifies here. Minus one for fortified. Uh, city is minus one. And then there's a differential in technology level. Technology level is also marked with these little gray pieces of wood. And those are just marked on the race. Has a little space. And you can increase technology, as far as I can tell, to no end. Uh, except the limit of the deck. Okay. If you succeed in your attack, uh, you take a population token out of your box and replace whoever's there with yours and they go back to their box. You've expanded that race. If you don't have an extra population token, you just kill them. If there's no one in the space, apparently, and this is kind of poorly written in terms of the rules, but they're so tiny that there aren't a lot of, you know, that it's not gonna be too big a deal. But I've said that in other games, and then said, you know, I forgot rules because they were, or didn't read them because they were poorly presented. Well, this may be one of those cases, but you can attack an empty area. You don't have to roll. You just place a piece. Again, very much like History of the World. Um, so now, if you roll a natural six and you win a space, which is why you have to roll when you're entering an empty space, you get a breakthrough. And in a breakthrough... Uh, trying to see if you must or may. Yeah, you may attack again from the newly conquered territory to try to take another space. Now, when you take spaces, if you don't have any counters left, you can withdraw a counter from the space you attacked from and move into another space to make some sort of tactical decision, uh, maybe for defense or whatever, or maybe to clear space for another one of your races, whatever. Um, okay. 
And then we go to the action phase. And here, each player also gets a chance to do something. And they have a number of different choices. They must play one of their cards, either a yellow, a red, or one of their numbered cards. Um, if it's red or yellow, it gets discarded. If it's one of the race cards, it's turned face up and left in front of the player. So, here's what you can do with an action card. You can increase the technology of a race by a point. And that'll increase its attack and defense, as shown in the combat phase. And you just put a marker on top of that race to indicate the higher technology. And this may be an issue, this may not be enough tokens to deal with all the technology. That may be why those blue ones were added uh, in order to increase that. Okay. You could also use a race's special ability. And that's listed on the action card itself. Now, the, uh, the different levels, I don't believe matter. The same special ability is on each card, and I think it's also on the numbered cards. This is sort of an event type effect. Uh, it may tell you something you do or something that changes in the game state, and it just, you know, is something that you're allowed to play in, in order to follow the instructions listed on it. However, if you play an action card that's a race that's been completely destroyed from the map, it has no more territory at all, you can't do either of those. Instead, you roll on the Divine Wrath table. And one of these things takes effect. On two through six, you get, well, yeah, you get to choose which area is affected. On one, it's the player to your right, which in my case means left. Uh, it's the player who just went, not the next player, essentially, uh, gets to make the choice. Okay? And that is actually it. That's the whole game. In my particular game, I've set up... Uh, certain gods and they each have their own abilities. These counters here have to do with the effects of the cards. Um, some of them are based on gods, some of them are just bonuses and defenses and whatever. Each of the races has its own special abilities, but those special abilities aren't really linked. So, for example, here I've got Necromancer's Living Dead. It has an effect. Well, that effect has nothing to do with the necromancers. The only reason the necromancers are on here, other than being linked to the, the, the uh, effect by name or, or by theme, is for the betting. That's all that card matters. Now these guys, these guys say, I'm due to protect that race. So you get the power of the race you're protecting. So there's another little link there. But that's the only way they're linked. Uh, these cards, doesn't mean that you have to use the necromancers in any way, for example, for that one. All right. Uh, well, let's look at the powers of the gods. I'm not going to look at all of them, just the ones that are in play, so that when you see my playthrough, you have some idea of who's got what. So here we have the goddess of peace, any territory occupied by a race whose destiny card is face up in front of the goddess of peace gets a permanent defense bonus of two points. That gives me a reason to turn those cards up, because my races will last longer. Of course, I can no longer attack with them. Uh, Goddess of Love gets four love markers. In a fortification phase, you can place one of these in a territory with a population token. As long as that population token stays there, and the love counter stays there, um, no attack can be launched from this territory. So, what does she get? Four love counters. We have little people going at it there. Uh, all right. We got the God of Death here. Every time he triggers Divine Wrath, this. He plays a card that somebody's not, that a race isn't uh, there. He rolls two dice instead of one and chooses which one he likes. Also, he can play an action card for a race that's not wiped off the map and declare Divine Wrath on that. 
I thought that was a really cool power, so he had to be picked. The God of War. Whenever he launches an attack, he gets a bonus of plus one. Hey, I'm going to be making lots of attacks. That seemed like a cool option. Here we have the God of Trickery. When he plays Destiny cards, he can play them face down, launching an attack with an attack bonus of one point, instead of using the special ability. Uh, or the other option, uh, which was... I don't remember what the other one was. Increasing technology. Okay. This allows him to keep his races secret. And it also allows him to attack with his races after he's used one of these cards. I thought that was a really, really cool card, and I wanted that one out. Uh, but these were all dealt out, two to each player, and they each made their own choice here. God of Wisdom, instead of betting at the beginning of turn 7, he places his bets at the beginning of turn 9. I thought that was really cool, an easy way to get some victory points at the end of the game. Not a lot of effect on the game, but... Should be able to sneak six victory points in. Uh, who knows, because that turn there could be some combat to wipe out his choices. And of course, he's still got to hold cards to do that. So, if he walks into that turn, let's see how many cards you're going to play. You have eight in your hand. You have a total of 13 cards. Nine of them get played during action rounds. So I've got four left. Four cards I'm not going to have to use. Uh, two of them are for betting. So I'm not, I'm not going to necessarily have a lot of choices, and it may mean having to turn some of these up so that I have bettables in my hand. I still think it was worth it and an interesting power. All right, I'm going to send this one up. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting game. It's just not the one I wanted. And I keep running into this problem where, you know... These, especially the Ameritrash, but even the Euros to some extent, and even some war games, uh, <laughs> end up just not convincing. You know, I have these higher hopes for something that I feel is described on the box or in the blurb, and I'm just not getting it when I buy the game. And I mean, this may be a perfectly great game. It really may be. I'm, I've got, I'm willing to, to give it an, an interesting shot, but it's not the one I wanted to buy. You know, I wanted to buy something using cards, using special powers and everything, but where the gods were really acting more godlike to me. Here, I feel like all I'm going to be doing is playing History of the World when it comes down to it on a somewhat more distracting board with less, uh, you know, less ability to link well to things. What's nice about this, it's an all an end game game. Uh, History of the World has this annoying little track where you count uh, points that you get for each era. This, I worry about one thing, what my position is at the end. That makes me a little happier. But, you know, I was really hoping, l l let me say what I was hoping for. There's an old Avalon Hill game, well, actually, Chaosium, I think, put it out first, called Elric. It's got problems. I was hoping for something kind of like it, you know, uh, where the gods are intervening on, on the earth and that, uh, you know, just really sort of a detailed picture of what's going on instead of kind of this abstract... Uh, Not, not, not anywhere near as flavorful, you know. I mean, Ameritrash gets uh, promoted as being all about theme and flavor. Well, when it comes down to it for me, this stuff doesn't match the theme and flavor that we had back in the early 80s or in the late 70s in terms of the games that were coming out on the fantasy side of things. Now, war games are still out there, and there's still people making some science fiction games out there. Uh, and another one from last, from a couple of years ago, you know, there are a few of them coming out. I have not seen anybody touching the fantasy games, and I'm hoping somebody like GMT, because I think they have the, uh, the biggest willingness to take the risk, uh, 
I'm hoping somebody starts designing some fantasy games and putting them into the P500 there. Because I think this has been a long neglected uh, genre. And even back in the heyday, when there were role playing games out there, you know, and that was the main in input into, into, the, into the adventure gaming hobby. And the big wargaming companies were putting out these fantasy themed games, you know, they still didn't quite get it right. Uh, they were close, they were close ones. I think Dark Emperor may be one of the best of them though, and that game gets a horrible rating because only one player gets to play usually you know, for the beginning of the game. Well, anyway, I've made my little plea for that, and I'll probably make another one when we get to the uh, when we get to the review section. Hope you guys take a watch of of the actual gameplay because hey, I'm learning how it's going to work out in the same way that you will be.